welcome to this evening's event. On behalf of London Innovation Society and Level 39, we would like to formally welcome everyone here. We hope that you leave tonight feeling motivated to start building or to continue working on your own startup businesses. So before we start, we're going to invite Asif. He is head of content of Level 39. He's going to explain a little bit about what Level 39 is all about and give you guys some more information on how we started. Asif? Good evening. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Great interaction already. Uh, thank you, Jemima. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Ali and London Innovation Society. I think that tonight's going to be a fantastic evening of education and learning. I'm, how long do I have to speak? 25 minutes. I'm going to do my own presentation now. Um, now, I'm going to be very brief. So, where you're standing right now is level 39. Um, and I thought it'd be useful to give you an explanation of what level 39 is. Some of you may have received my newsletter. It has a 45% open rate, so I'm quite proud of that. I think everyone was wondering about my achievements. Um, level 39 is home to 200 technology startups. So this is a very unique environment in London, in the world. We've been running for five years and we're so proud to have helped companies, small startups, go from one, two employees, all the way up to 200, 300, 500. Some of my favorite stories, entrepreneurs, are companies like Revolut, eToro, uh, Ripple. These are companies which are here at Level 39. My invitation uh, to all of you tonight is be more engaged with our community, if you wish. Uh, you would have already see, received my email, potentially, but if you need to get in touch with me, I'll be here for the rest of the evening. Uh, we're Level39CW on Twitter, so follow us there. The only thing I probably have to say is that I'm so happy to invite Peter here tonight because what he is going to talk about and the contents of his book are so closely aligned with what we do here, which is how do we make entrepreneurs better, work more efficiently, make less mistakes. Uh, and we feel as though we have a partial solution to that, which is put entrepreneurs close to each other who share, who are on the same journey. So that they can connect with each other and they can uh, come up with solutions together. And that's really been our philosophy. Connections, networks. We changed our name, in fact. Level 39, the world's most connected technology community. Because that's how much we value the importance of valuable connections. So, that was my few minutes done. Thank you. I'm gonna hand over now to the more interesting portion of tonight. Enjoy your evening. I'll be here for the remainder of the evening, if you like. Thank you. Thank you, Asif. Now I would like to introduce Dr. Solomon. He's going to come up and talk a bit more about London Innovation Society. Thank you, Joanna. Welcome, everyone. Uh, it's great to see a crowd uh, coming up for our fifth uh, Building Communism in Sky uh, se uh, seminar, hopefully. Um, hopefully and it's the first of the 2019. We have been going for the last uh, uh, year, uh, and this is uh, going to hopefully uh, be another successful event, uh, starting the year with Peter. Uh, thanks for accepting our offer uh, to come and talk tonight. Uh, what London Innovation Society uh, aims with these seminars is really to bring together people of the similar uh, interest area, investment or entrepreneurship, and then give the opportunity to network and also share uh, experiences. More uh, than that, uh, with uh, people who have the experience, uh, such as Peter, uh, they have the medium to uh, touch on their personal stories. And he really values uh, this personal touch onto the information that's widely available elsewhere, uh, uh, not, not in a very personal form. Um, in innovation society, what we do is uh, we do skills development, networking, and basically trying to introduce role models uh, in the form of either uh, industrial experts or uh, academics uh, doing supervisory uh, or mentoring uh, engagements with, uh, with people who like to develop their uh, uh, entrepreneurial story. And uh, to that end, we sometimes collaborate with universities, sometimes with uh, companies, startups, or, uh, or uh, bigger ventures. To, uh, make, uh, uh, to, to make an event, and also to make a workshop, uh, and, and basically continue to do so as a not-for-profit uh, venture. 
Um, what uh, we do is uh, we try to encourage people to come and join uh, to help in these uh, uh, in, in these um, activities. Not just because we need those people, but also I think we, we give people a good platform uh, in the very connected community of uh, level 39 to come and try out what they need to uh, learn to expand their horizon beyond what uh, actually uh, their day-to-day -day job is. Uh, things are changing quite quickly and we are focused on basically trying to develop ourselves and also the, our network with the, the, with the new technological uh, uh, aspects of data science, uh, artificial intelligence, and also the typical uh, starting point of coding uh, to, to introduce those ideas. Um, so I very much would encourage you to visit our webpage uh, to see what sort of volunteering positions are available, and also uh, give us a uh, feedback, please, uh, about what can be of interest to you and the people whom you know uh, that are struggling to come up with a successful venture. Uh, that's all from me. Uh, I would like to pass back to Jemima. Uh, and thanks again for uh, joining us now. Thank you, Dr. Solomon. So if you want more information on London Innovation Society, you can definitely find them on all their social media links. They are on LinkedIn, Facebook, and you can follow them on Twitter as well. So tonight's talk will be given by Peter. Uh, Peter is a tech entrepreneur, angel investor, author and president of the European Business Angel Network. He has invested in over 65 technology startups and has mentored hundreds of entrepreneurs. His latest book, The Invested Investor, is the most readable business book for angels and entrepreneurs. So if everybody could please help me welcome Peter. Right, thank you very much indeed to the, to the organizers and of course to you for turning up. Thank you. So I hope I can uh, educate you and to some extent entertain you now for about an hour. The structure is going to be, um, I, I see how long it is, but it's the order of 30, 35 minutes of me talking through some slides and then 20, 25 minutes of questions and answers. So we won't do questions in the middle, we'll do it at the end. When you do ask questions, can you please not make it specific about your own startup? I want to, I'll only answer questions which are generic that everybody's interested. You can talk to me later and catch me, um, which is fine. So I, my slide deck isn't here at the moment, but it will tell you in a sec. Fine, thank you. Good, so there's three slides on me, about 10 slides on what angels are looking for and how we process investments, and then there's four or five slides on what I've learned over the last um, decade or so of angel investing and. 40 or so years of being an entrepreneur. So the first slide, which is, has been mentioned before, I uh, started a project a couple of years ago, two and a half years ago, to scale myself, so I'm not just talking to the 80 or 100 people we've got here, but much bigger audiences, which is a set of podcasts and uh, a book. The first book, was planning the second book at the moment, and the co-founder of that business with my son, who's around somewhere, I can't see him at the moment, and we're obviously uh, selling some books for your money. Um, so a little bit about my background that got me here, which is, you know, why I... And you know, wanted to, to you, why you wanted me to be here. So first of all, um, I my first experience of working for an entrepreneur was in anybody from Australia. That's unusual. Screw 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 side. If anybody was from Australia, they, when I said I worked for a guy called Dick Smith, they'd go what? Because he's the equivalent of Richard Branson. It's like working for Richard Branson on day one. Anyway, so I worked for this guy who's completely mad and he used to jump around the shop on a motorised poker stick, and that sort of rubbed off on me a bit. Ended up um, at Cambridge University in the UK, and uh, my first little startup was in 1975, which was a travelling discotheque, in the days when discotheques were discs who went round, as opposed to this modern DJ. Uh, ran that for a year, really enjoyed that. Did computer science, and then joined a corporate called Logico, which some of the older people in this room might know, which grew to about 40,000 people and was bought by a Canadian company, but it gave me a bit of corporate life. And I do like my entrepreneurs to have been through some corporate life before I invest in them, because they understand people, politics, and hiring, and firing, and process, etc. I then moved on to live in Bavaria, which was, that's the Oktoberfest for those who've been, um, and uh, had my first startup there, which uh, that's not on the slide, which is called Gepcom, um, which is a, was an industrial electronics company, which, which I was running the tech department for. Moved back to the UK and set up Camdata, which I still have, which my son runs, which is now 34, 35 years old. 
uh, which is what I started this entire bit of heads ups and downs, so you'll see in the, the next slide. Moved on to property development, building houses and doing some property refurbishment. So lots of entrepreneurial journeys, nothing very spectacular like my friends. I mean, I've got a friend who's a Cambridge angel who you'll have heard of Indeed.com, I suspect, the job site. He sold that for, um, it was certainly over a billion dollars, and he had about 40% of it, so that was a, a decent size exit. I've had nothing like that, but I've had a lot of journeys which have taught me a lot. And then I did a lot of charity work, um, Citizens Advice Bureau. This is Russell Brown, for those who recognise. I was chair of the charity where he got clean, um, an educational charity. Then my first investment, and I didn't even know what an angel was when I invested in somebody I was mentoring, which we sold quite quickly. That was called Go Test It, it's long gone. And joined the group called the Cambridge Angels, which I'm now chair of for another six months or so. And from there, I've just learned everything. As an angel, if you're an angel audience, I would say join a group. You'll learn so much from that. Don't do it by yourself. You're not doing entrepreneurial things. And then moved on to a number of other roles, including an uh, um, uh, educational role at uni, at uh, Cambridge University, and then this. I'm now president of the trade body for the whole of Europe, which is a really interesting job because I'm a Brit in a Brexiting <laughs> situation. I mean, I've got a board of 24 members, of which 23 come from different countries, etc. Anyway, these are my startups. So doesn't say that. The only things I want you to look at are the fact that I basically like B2B primarily, but it doesn't quite say that, but 55% of the business were B2B. And of the 14, I've got three, of course, still active. I've had to shut quite a few down. I've sold some, and I've merged ones with other ones. So I've had basically been through most entrepreneurial journeys any of you would do in your lives. The graph at the bottom is cam data, and I don't know, there's plenty of people just about old enough to recognise how bad it was in 1991. It's a very big recession here in the UK, probably worse than 2000, and that was my sales income during that period. Really, really, really tough. And the north is going bust and then recovering. But then I moved on about eight, nine years ago, sort of <coughs> ended up stumbling into angel investing. These are some of the investments I've made. They're all on my website all the successes, all the failures, why I think they've failed. And you won't recognize many of those. There's quite a few London-based, but I don't really do B2C, so I don't do anything that the average consumer in general would recognize the brand. And again, the numbers are there, so I've had five positive exits, that's one X or above, nine failures, so that's about one third, two thirds, which is about what it is for startups which take external investment. It's very different if you don't take external investment. I've just been having a meeting with the CEO of one of my portfolio, um, which is slightly off what I normally do, but he's pretty pissed off with the investors who are pushing him harder than he'd like to be pushed. Strange, you know, he seems to have lost his ambition. We tend to push companies to the point where they will squeak and might fail. So do bear that in mind. I'll come back to that in a minute. I've still got 53 that's still, 54 now that's still alive. This is the most, first most important slide. Do not go for external investment unless you really need it. You're much better off getting investment, inverted commas, from non-dilutative capital, i.e. you don't lose any shares, i.e. from customers. Because customer money, as I say, doesn't, you don't give away any of your company, and you're proving that magical thing of product market fit because somebody's buying something from you. Now, my wife works for a drug discovery company that's raised $400 million already without making a sale. You don't discover drugs on, on customer income, clearly. So there are obviously companies that do need investment, but bear that in mind. If you can do it from customers, do it. So what's the business angel? Many, let's put, just see, who in this room has had investment from an angel already? Very few, unless you're really shy. None. No, one person there. He said he just put his hand up, so he hasn't had much money. Um, and so who is seeking, or thinks they're seeking, from an angel some investment? Again, not that many. Okay, let's just ask another question, just so I can understand the audience. Who has been on, or is, or is now on, an entrepreneurial journey? That's better. That's interesting. So there's lots of entrepreneurs, but not that many necessarily looking for capital. Well, we'll wait and see whether you've changed your minds by the end of this talk. Um, so let's just walk through what's a business angel. First of all, it's a source of capital, as you'd expect. Second, it's a source of networking. Networking for other capital, networking for customers, contact with regulators, all the usual things. We tend to have pretty good Rolodexes. Thirdly, we're patient. 
So this is the idea of, uh, obviously, chi uh, um, chick, chick, what are they called? chicks that are hatching and waiting to get out of the egg. We, we, we are forced to be patient. And in the deep tech world I live in, in Cambridge, we expect an exit to take 12 to 14 years. That's a good exit. That's a $100 million exit, that sort of size, rather than 10 million or 20 million dollars or pounds. It takes a very long time. Of course, in the B2C world, possibly in the FinTech world, it might be quicker, but you can't really build a big business in under five years. You know, and seven, eight, nine could easily happen at the time of getting to the point where you've got an exit that's in the, um, up at the 100 million plus. So we've got to be patient. We can't easily get out. We'll come back to that later. Control my own money, this is different. Anybody work as a VC? Yep. Well, uh, well, I don't know, you might be an angel investor as well, but I, if I lose something because it's failed, I lose it. I lose the price of a house, a small house up north, of course, not down here, or a car or something. Because a VC might lose a bit of money, but they don't lose nearly as much as an angel. So then I control my own money and lose VCs in general profit share, but don't loss share. So it's quite a different mentality. I won't go into it unless you want to <laughs> talk about it later. Um, and then we have corporate governance, we have you know, making sure tax returns are, are, are taxes are filed, etc. So there's a level providing that one of us on the board, and I never invest unless there is an angel investor director on the board, provide that. So what makes a good entrepreneur? Now bear in mind, this is my experience, there's plenty of other people out there that invest, there are plenty of examples which break the guidelines I'm about to say, but I'm going to go through this. So first of all, a team of two or three. But I do not, oh, I do have some single founders. I don't like investing in a single founder. It's a single point, point of failure. If there's two founders, uh, then they will feed off each other and solve problems. If there's a single founder, it's, it's a lonely being a founder anyway. It's just even more lonely if you're a single founder. And there's no co-CEOs. It's really important for the investor there's a single point of contact with the CEO. So just think about that. They must obviously have passion, drive, and persistence, the sort of thing you'd expect. You know, um, otherwise, then we soon detect that. There must be great listeners. I'll come back to that in a minute. You must have an intense ambition to scale. This is really important, and this is checked. I mean, obviously, it's just words at the beginning because we're investing. I invest very early stage, but you must detect the fact they really want to scale and don't want to get to the point where it becomes a lifestyle business because we can't get out. We are going to drive you as investors to grow, even if it means failure. You must be flexible, plan, discard the plan, the famous pivot word. You must be able to pivot. You can only pivot if you listen. So you're listening to the market, nobody else. Because most businesses do pivot at some point on their journey. Um, you must do, have some marketing research. In other words, you must be able to justify the numbers on the deck. The, we only need to see, in my view, the uh, cash flow forecast to the point of the next round, which is usually 18 months out. And this CAC versus LTV is really important. Customer acquisition cost, lifetime value. Really difficult to predict at the beginning, but a, pro a, a business that stands on its own two feet <coughs> has a lifetime value of customers, obviously more than the cost of acquiring them. That's absolutely clear. And the multiple of that. So you must be able to at least justify your thought process along that. Uh, by the way, I will. Uh, these slides will be available later. I'm not sure how they'll be distributed by the organisers, but there will be a way of doing that. Uh, be fun to fun to work with and socialise with. That's only applies really if I'm going to be close to the board, and I'm close to the board of about 15 companies, and on the board of nine of them. If I'm just a more distance investor, that's less important. Right, um, three slides with images. Entrepreneurs must listen. So the, this is this is the time between first point of contact and investment, and the investors spend a lot of time working out whether the entrepreneurs are going to be able to listen later on. Now, clearly you need drive, passion, singularity of direction, etc. But at the same time, you must be able to listen because things change. The market changes, the you know, customers change, all kinds of things change. So we've got to make sure you will listen. Trust. So if we can build up a relationship between the investor and the, and the entrepreneurs in such a way that trust is there, and it starts when we first meet you from then on, um, then that will make a better journey. And the best way to do that, however difficult it is, is to tell the truth. Really difficult, because you won't trust us to start with. We're generally older than you. We've been through things. We've had our battle scars for things in life. But if we can do that in an open way, and this is what the book's all about. And then the other thing that you must do as entrepreneurs is check us out. Make sure 
we're going to be the right investors for you. Now, obviously, if I'm still leading, I'll be checking out the other potential investors anyway, and making sure I've thrown out loads of investors that have pledged money over the years where I didn't think they were going to be the right sort of investors. So do check us out. I've got a story of one where he went, not just through my, um, the reference I'd given him, but he went through my LinkedIn and started contacting people. So that's the right thing to do. Right, this is to do with the process of getting into the point where we spend some time face to face. Not, you're the auditors of angels and I'm the entrepreneur of a step front, but it's a one-to-one -one meeting. So, because in my case, I've just changed the rules of getting at me on my website. I was getting about 1,500 incoming um, deals a year, of which probably a 1,000 I could have looked at closely because I've got all my criteria on my website. So it's now we have to go through 71. I was only I'm investing six to seven, so I'm turning away 99.5% of what's coming in. That's changed quite a lot. Um, so you must do the research on us. You must decide who you want as investors. You know, what the ones, obviously money is money, and uh, an element of dumb money is fine, but you really ought to try and get some smart money. If you don't get the smart money, which you wouldn't do, generally, if you crowdfund, not always, but generally, but do that, work out who you really want on your, on your share cap capital table. This is in the book, really, but this is just a reminder. In my view, there are 12 to 15 slides needed. The first slide is an entry slide. I won't go through these all. The second slide, the most important of all, and the lesson which you'll see later, it took me several years to work out, is that I don't invest in tech. I don't invest in product. I don't invest in markets. I invest in people. They must have an idea, clearly, but I invest in the people and their ability to execute. Because actually, when it comes down to it, and you can talk to many, many entrepreneurs who've been on journey, it's actually easier to raise money in the current environment in London or the southeast of England than it is to execute on, on with that money, to a success rate. And I just want to run through the ways of, attract, of contacting snail mail. I just put that on there because it's actually pretty novel. I haven't had many things come through the letterbox, but I think that might just about work. Phone, please don't. If you can find a number, that is, of course. <laughs> Email, again, please don't. <laughs> There's too much going on in there. I've had people approach me on Twitter, which is really novel as well, but hasn't really worked. LinkedIn, far too many. The problem about LinkedIn is that, because I've got the criteria there, they tend to get in without looking at the criteria, so they mostly go. Face-to-face, um, -face good. You know, I'm sure one or two of you, or perhaps more than that, will come up to me later on. That gives you a chance to do the elevator pitch, the magical elevator pitch. Just don't drag it on if there's a queue of people wanting to talk to me. Um, Baron Angel Group, that's a pretty good way, because you'll get, in some cases, the one here in London, which was London Business Angels, now called Newable, will do some pitch practicing for you, spend some time, they'll charge you for it, but they will actually get you to the point where you can pitch more effectively in front of a group of angels. This is the most important. If you can get, and this is what's now on my website, if you can get to another party who vetted you, it's going to be much easier for me to spend time talking to you. So how do we process investments? You probably can guess this. There's nothing really new. An initial pitch and discussions. Further investigations, we start to do due diligence on you, and you do on us, of course. Um, so this is still hasn't got to the point where there's any form of pledge to invest. It's sort of, we're interested. Um, obviously, then at this point, unless you're going out for a second or third round where you've already got traction in some form, There'll be some tweaking to do for what you're doing, which will help you with that. Then we talk about terms. The easiest term to talk about actually is valuation. There's a whole stack of other things which I won't go into today. Things like vesting, board composition, shareholder consent, and investor direct consent, etc., which are actually more difficult to negotiate than the price. Um, form an investor group, which is assuming there's a syndicate coming in, and another piece of advice, and do not take money from a single investor. Do not do that because you'll get to the point where they'll want a level of control will be on the board. But the worst thing of all is if you go out for more money and they refuse to invest, then you're stuck. Because who's going to invest if the board member who's already put some money in isn't going to invest in this round? Sign the term sheet, undertake the legals, complete. And it takes an average of 5.2 months from the point of initial contact to the point of close. So obviously it's it has to be quicker, it has to take longer. This one at the moment, which is still with bed bugs, believe it or not, and it's taken about 10 months to close, but the rounds ended up being a lot more than we expected. What should you ask me, or an angel? Um, you should take references. This is to do with getting the due diligence the other way, get references from entrepreneurs the angels previously backed, and obviously the, the ones that like to be big references for an employee 
It's the ones that you approach that haven't been given. You shall give the more honest answer, generally. Um, how much time, ask the angel how much time. It may be zero, that's fine, nothing wrong with that. Um, but if you want somebody closed or on the board, you've got to try and work out how much time. And, you know, you've seen, you know board meetings, uh, intra-board board meetings, between board meetings, etc. Um, how much money do you think we need? That's got to agree with your figure, because the, the, the use of capital, A, uh, it will probably be wrong, the timing will be wrong, but you must understand that the amount of capital needed is, how am I doing for time, anyway? No, I need to have time for questions. About 20 minutes, is it 15 minutes? Fine, okay. Um, can and will you personally follow on? Again, we go to this later, it's really important that the angel can, can afford to follow on. Uh, can you connect us? This is connect to the next round of angels and maybe the VCs or the angel co-fund or etc. Um, what other investments you have in the space? I'm quite unusual, not completely, I mean it's not unique by any means, of putting all my investments on my website. That's starting to happen. I hope this is a trend for the, there are about 100, 100 150 people who are basically full-time professional inverted commas angels. You won't be able to get at all of them, but it, they can tell you, make it easier for you to choose the angels by having you something on the website that help, or on the LinkedIn, of course. How else can you help us? Uh, right, uh, so that's basically gone through the journey of connecting to an angel and associating with them. I haven't talked about what happens after that. The next few slides are just a bit about me and what I'm interested in. This is not necessarily relevant. I'm, as you'll see, I'm interested in particularly deep tech. That probably doesn't apply to that much of the audience. But it's important to work out if you, that when you approach an angel, you understand it's worth your time doing that. And this is, can be difficult, but I'm just going to go through this. It's my investment criteria. Don't bother to read it, obviously. I'm just going to go through that in images. So the first image is, as I said, a team of two or three. Second one is support. So this is, I want to be able to support you on the journey. If you stop talking to me, I'll stop supporting you, really. And I have that. So if you look at my group of investments, they break into thirds, so about 15, 16, 17, I'm either on the board, I know the CEO, the entrepreneur really well. 15 or 16, I know the investor director really well. And then 15 or 16, actually, I've, I've sort of lost interest, they've lost interest in talking to me, or they've grown too big to talk to the angels. I mean, there's an investment which is an online platform for CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, that's raised about $20 million, and is mainly focused at the States. They don't talk to me any longer, which I would like them to, but I'd let them get on with it. Lifetime value of customer acquisition costs, I mentioned that before. It's got to be a minimum of about three or four, and it'd be nice if it was seven or eight. These are maybe just theoretical numbers, but you're getting proper. But if you can get a 10x on that between life, cost of customer acquisition and lifetime value, lifetime value, I should explain, is the gross margin contribution, not the revenue. So it's the, it's the, the, the money that will go to running the business, not the revenue. I do deep tech and B2B, that's because of my background, what I understand, and uh, the risk I'm wanting to and willing to take. I'm happy, this would be, if it were a VC, this would be nothing, but I'm happy with it's a 100 million something market. An, an angel can have a really good exit, even with the, the revenue on exits, only in the very low minimums. You can still get a 10x or 20x on that with the right amount of IP, and it's growing rapidly. This is to do with defensibility, you might know this from Monty Python, it's this l level of defensibility. So this could be not necessarily a patent. I don't actually believe much in patents. I believe in freedom to operate, but not patents. Patents are very expensive and may never prove their worth. But it must, you must be freedom to operate. It may be the barrier to entry might be technology, maybe ideas. It almost certainly won't be brand. I don't because a B2B brand isn't very important. A B2C brand clearly is. It's, in my case, it's got to be within 90 minutes of my home, my public transport. This is something, I, I went to Israel, Tel Aviv for a week, a couple of years ago, and there were, uh, apologies if you're Israeli, <laughs> but I think you'll understand this caricature I'm about to give you. They are great hustlers, wonderful hustlers. So they knew this 90 minute rule, but they still did their best to get <laughs> in front of me and get me some investment. This is so that I can do due diligence on your premises in the time while I'm doing the uh, before investment and I can meet you on your premises and whatever you're doing. And I do quite a lot of hardware, so it's useful to do that, again, if I've invested. Um, the, this is to do with belonging, being syndicated. I will never, never invest alone. 
I'd only invest the minimum syndication size for the first round is probably six angels, and the maximum is probably 15. And no to ICO. I could almost delete that now, couldn't I? Because ICO seem to have gone over the peak. There's still stuff going on in, in certain, uh, Crypto Valley and in, in, um, Zurich, etc. but ICO seem to have gone. I just, when I don't do crypto, I don't do ICO, and I really struggle with blockchain, but you can ask me about it. <coughs> right, Ten, the top, this is, this is from cbinsights.com, you might know that. This slide's quite old, but I suspect it hasn't changed. You won't be able to read the top two. When you add the top two together, you get the statement on the right there. So most of the time, you will fail if you've had external investors, if you haven't, if you can't raise more investment. Because if you can't raise more investment and you're loss making, where you're going to pay, how you're going to pay the salaries. And so what it's saying there is, you haven't found enough product market fit to break even, so you've either got to exit or, 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 or break even or fail. So that's really important. So basically, something like three quarters of all startups, which is about the number of startups that will fail, are shut down by the investors because we haven't got the faith to continue investing in you, and you as entrepreneurs can't find anybody else to invest. Bear that in mind, really important. We do take a level of control over your business. We're relying on you to grow the business, clearly, because we're non-exec and we're investors, but you've got to have a good relationship to make sure, and you've got to hit targets, or if you don't hit targets, you've got to explain why, you've got to pivot, you've got to have a down round if necessary, just to keep the investment going. Um, some stats of mine. Founding team size average less than two, therefore I do back single founders. So I've got my best investment I've just seen at lunchtime today has just had an offer, mm. can I tell you this? Um, yes, uh, of over $100 million for the business. It's about eight years old, um, and it's a single founder. Um, ninth, I, I tend to like people who've had good academic qualifications. This doesn't apply, you know, whether you like sugar or not, low sugar or not. You know, clearly he hasn't had much education, I suspect, but he's been very successful. Um, Richard Branson, similarly. I tend to like people who've been through good universities. I'm not, even though I'm a fellow of the management school in Cambridge, I, I don't invest necessarily in MBAs. People have got MBAs. Um, there's, there's some people call it management by accident. I don't know if you've heard that term. <laughs> I'm sure some of you have got MBAs, so apologies. And you'd have paid £60,000 for them as well. Uh, average age, sort of somewhat higher than I expected when I did the stats. So this is because, as you see, quite a few of them are serial entrepreneurs, or at least second entrepreneurs. 20% born overseas, and I must apologize, as I always have to with the 70% female. This is because I invest in B, deep tech B2B, and generally the STEM education in the UK, not overseas, isn't followed by women that much. So therefore, it's a lowish number. It is creeping up, and I've got a great female founder of a company called Repositive, who's actually Danish, as it turns out, in Cambridge, where it comes to genomic data um, sets. Uh, 45% re re repeat entrepreneurs, but not all successful. I'd much rather invest in somebody who's had an entrepreneurial journey and has failed than one that hasn't started out, because I can guarantee you, you will have learned a lot on that journey. Um, so, but I don't self-select them necessarily, but it just happens I'm more, well, I don't know who I do select those. Contact close, we talked about. Close to failure, five months, can you imagine that? Putting some money in and five months they go bust. Isn't that really embarrassing? Hopefully I learned something from that. 68 months so far is the shortest. That was actually quite a big exit to a quoted Austrian company. And that sold for its IP portfolio, which was patented in fact, that case. It was a, a, a gas center for mobile devices. Um, close, this is, well, that's to failure, sorry, 68 months. Close to success, 15 to 46. 15 was an accurate hire by rights move of a company I'd invested in. I think they exited too early. But I got a 1.4x in 14, 15 months, which is a pretty good return on IRR of 25%. Um, and this is, shows where they are. So the 53 is still alive. You know, what's that? Two thirds are growing. The, the red ones are static. Zombie basically means that nothing's happening there. If they're really zombie, they're not even talking. They, and this example in Cambridge of a company that's a zombie that's not getting staff left, but it's still generating profit somehow and the failing ones, which of course, I've had one fail in the last couple of weeks. Right, slide on what I've learned, which this slide is primarily aimed at angels, but you will learn something from it. I'm almost getting to the end, we'll go to um, Q&A in a minute. Back teams, not technology, no market. 
back to people. It took me about four years to work this out. I think because I'm pretty geeky, engineering background, early use of computers, etc., through wearables, if you've noticed. Um, it's, but it's the people that matter, not the, I, I, you know, you fall, when I fall in love with the technology, that's, I really ought to walk away. Um, entrepreneurs two or three, but then, look at that, but not in an emotional relationship. So I wouldn't, in fact, I can't see with the audience, but I've signed a book for two who have the same surname, <laughs> I assume they're other brother and sister, in which case they're probably not in an emotional relationship, or the husband wife, and I will struggle to do that, and angels generally will. And I will explain that, because some of you might be setting up businesses with your other half. It's because you're actually investing in a single founder, as far as we're concerned, because it's very unlikely they're going to disagree much about something. So they'll work stuff out. More importantly, if they were to split up, you've got a situation where there's a warring, potentially, couple of founders who are trying to unwind their own emotional problems at the same time building a business. This can be truth, we've talked about that. Prepare to walk through walls or find the hidden door. It's really important that the entrepreneur can solve all the problems, if at all possible, however insurmountable they are, on their journey. Because there will be all kinds of problems. I mean, for instance, uh, a business I'm involved with had a, quite a big contract, about 1.4 million a year, with uh, dollars a year, with JP Morgan, and then suddenly the CEO changed and they shut down the whole department, which is about 150 people, including losing the contract. You know, you just gotta cope with that sort of thing. Nothing we could do about that at all. Um, invest early, add value, that's really important to me. So the risk is higher, but the rewards are potentially higher. Add value wherever I can, when I've got time. Angels should be prepared to invest, certainly a second time, because the chance of the plan you give us on day one being right is zero, basically. Um, so we need to put some more money in, um, and then put, possibly put some more money into growth capital. Numbers game, this is really aimed at angels, not you, but this is to do with portfolio size, risk reduction, and this is so important. You hopefully be able to tell from the passion I have about the, the, you know, the ecosystem we're all living in, or working in, that I really enjoy spending time with you, spending time with entrepreneurs, and to some extent, spending time with investors. And probably the most important thing of all, once I'm gonna look at somebody in the audience, I'll look at you, unfortunately, when I've written you a check and you've given me a share certificate, we are bound together. You can't buy me back out again for the value I've given you, and you can't get rid of me. We are stuck together. It is possible, possibly easier to get divorced than to sell the shares. You have, you're on a long journey. It's a deep tech journey for decades. You cannot do that. You can go bust, of course, and you'll get rid of that relationship, but please don't give up and say, you have to get rid of me. <laughs> it just happens. <laughs> so just briefly, um, this is an ultimate slide. In order to scale myself, I decided some time ago to um, go electronic. So with the podcast, I don't know. Anybody listen to any of our podcasts? Stunning fans. One, two, exactly. There's a lot of them. Uh, there's some great ones, and there's perhaps not great ones, but there's a lot of information there. We're actually, the next book is about taking the podcast content and putting it into book form with the lessons that were learned by loads of entrepreneurs. Middle guys, uh, do you know Gonzalo from Syndicate Room, for instance? Guy on the right set up a company which is called Booking.com now. You've probably heard of that one. And the guy on the left, uh, this is a lovely story. Uh, it's an antibody sales platform in Cambridge. He um, set it up in 99. He raised 600K, and that's all. And that's worth 2.3 billion on, on the main market here. And he has about 30% or so, no, 700 million or so, all on 600K. And the rest of the money needed came from customers. And finally, the last slide, so we can move on to questions, is just a picture of me, which my wife likes. Okay, shall we, how long have we got? Uh, 20. 20 minutes. Oh, well, that's good, isn't it? Right, um, so I'm just going to get my ball. So we don't have a roving mic, so I will repeat the questions, um, if you have any, of course, or maybe you just want to get on with these things. Question here. You mentioned that you don't think investing is a part of your house uh, on the best time to invest, for example. Yeah. So what about very close friends? Yeah. Okay, so uh, the question is, I don't invest in their emotional connection, what about very close friends? No, absolutely. So what, one of the questions I'll ask is, to the founders, assuming you know, there's two or three of them, how
how did you meet? And how long have you known each other? And what have you done together? That trust bond between the founders is really important. I, I, and this, m most of you won't be on LinkedIn with me, but I did a blog post about exiting founders, and, it, and I've been on the board of two companies where a co-founder has left the business. That is really, really painful. So if you've got a good relationship already, and then we can see that during due diligence, that's really important. So that is a very positive thing. That's a great question because it leads on to that statement. Okay, one there. Yeah, so, so what I said was that I've kicked out co-investors. Have I been excluded? Um, have I been excluded? No, I've deal-led 20-odd deals and seven of, 20-odd 20, 20 that have been successful and seven that haven't. So that means I've dropped out of the journey. But I have actually been excluded. No, I don't think I have. So, no, perhaps I should be... Uh, Perhaps you should do that to me. So I can experience being rejected, being dumped by somebody. You'd have to be dumped by the deal leader. You know. So, no, good question. Uh, this chap here? Yes, yeah, you. Sir. about the angel here, not the entrepreneur. Right. Yeah. So what he's saying is, why wouldn't an angel use a crowdfunding platform rather than going through an angel group? They do, of course. There's, if you take the numbers, there's probably low number of thousands of angels who invest direct, and probably 200,000 of the crowd, and I wouldn't call them angels, some of them will be, but very few of them invest through platforms. I don't, because I want a relationship and to actually understand the entrepreneurs. That's what drives me, to spend time with the entrepreneurs. I want to be on the cap table, I want direct access. But if you've got, if you don't want the hassle of getting, spending the time, say you're working in the city here, and you've got a full-time job and you want to do some angel investing, of which there will be literally thousands, probably low thousands, in, you know, within a mile or two of here, then do that because you haven't got the time. There are disadvantages to crowdfunding, of course, the, and advantages for you, because the valuations are generally higher, the amount of DD is much less, if you can do a good pitch and answer the questions on the, um, the Q&A session in the forum, then you'll probably get investment. So you will probably sell less of your business, sell less equity to get the same amount of cash coming in. But it's becoming proved because of all the data that for entrepreneurs, getting money from the crowd is probably detrimental. The number of failures is much higher on crowdfunding generally than it is by getting human angels. But it is a lot easier for the entrepreneur. For the angel, yes. Well, the crowd, yeah, it's much easier. You sit at your you know, laptop in the evening watching football and you're investing. And you can get a portfolio of 100 companies for 10 grand you know, in the space of you know, a few weekends. So, yes, they do do it. It isn't my uh, modus operandi. A modus operandi. Okay, uh, this guy here. You said that you like to invest in deep tech. What's your approach to uh, product due diligence? Product due diligence on deep tech, good question. Um, I will always invest in the syndicate. I expect somebody in the syndicate to understand. Very rarely do we uh, pay for due diligence. Might do occasionally on patents and freedom to operate, but not on that. We, um, uh, we rely on, certainly the Cambridge, the group of the angels to do that. So I would expect, it's usually the angel who knows the most that then leads the deal and then goes on to sit on the board. So yes, it's done by, because in the end, you're not really investing in product, you're investing in people. So you trust the people who've done something with it. Obviously, and I've got lots of stories of things where they haven't been truthful and we've pulled out of it, but that's the, that's the case. So there's a guy right at the back who seems to be looking at his phone now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a difficult one, we'd have to shout it, otherwise I won't hear it. I missed a word out. How to convince something invest private investor was it? And foreigner. Foreign. Foreign. A foreign, foreign investor that it still continues to be worth investing in the UK. Um, no answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to get dragged into bloody Brexit. I can assure you. <laughs> but there's a guy there with a beard. Oh, yeah, um, 
I, I don't answer that question. Uh, the, the answer to that is that should I get a good return, it's how much it moves the needle in my personal life and what I want to leave to my children or pay to charity. And so the quantum is, you can work it out if you're looking at the cap tables and, and my investment, there's enough there, but it's how, it's my influence and help on that journey. And, and I, I have put perhaps more than that in, you know, so I don't put a million in each, clearly. I haven't got to put 67 million into, into this. So it's, it's, I've learned a lot from being on what turns out to be 81 journeys, that's 67 investments and 14 of my own startups. So I'm not going to ask, answer that directly. You can ask the tax man, they'll probably tell you. No. So investing in a company without product or MVP, I often do that. So I'm willing to do that. That's the idea. Just yeah, well, just a pitch deck. No, it needs a little bit more than that. <laughs> so, or it would be at a very low valuation. But yeah, no, I'm often investing in things that the product isn't ready, may never be ready. A sort of science experiment particularly stuff that's coming out of Cambridge University. I've done seven deals out of the university which haven't necessarily proved any form of product market fit and the product hasn't been ready. If it was an app, and I don't invest in apps, I definitely wouldn't. I would expect to see the app in MVP form with a level of traction. So, um, yeah, again, sorry. Uh, no, sorry, I'll come back to you, but sorry. Uh, yes, this gentleman here. What's my best and worst experience? Well, the best experience has led to uh, founders, quite a few founders coming to my 60th birthday party a few years ago, you know, where they become friends. You know, I've been to weddings and things like that. You know, there will be relationships, friendship relationships I would expect to have. Obviously, they'll almost certainly live longer than me for the rest of my life. So that's the rest. The worst is pretty awful. Um, and I'm not quite sure what to say here. Um, um, mm, 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 mm. Uh, I will tell you this, <laughs> it won't get back to him. I, I was talking to an entrepreneur in the last two or three weeks where we are not getting on very well for reasons that I won't go into. And I, <laughs> this is a bit embarrassing to say, particularly on camera. Um, and I am um, going to leave the board and I suggested they needed adult supervision. <laughs> Which was an awful thing to say, but I've said it on camera. <laughs> I, I was so I, I'm just it's, you know it's what's happened to relationships broken down the sort of thing one yeah, anyway. so yeah that's bad and there are other occasions which usually involve lack of communication that is really difficult there's one at the moment I've got where we finally got a shareholder update out which is three years late which we haven't had a shareholder update for three years I really wouldn't spend any time talking to anyone that chap then this chap here. Yeah, the range of valuations. That is on my website and my criteria. So I typically, and it of course doesn't apply in this building at all, I mean, I've only had one investment actually in this building, um, which actually went bust. Um, it's, I'd like to go in at a million or less. Now if you go back to the old days, and there was, it will cycle, there's no doubt, whatever happens, whether there's a downturn, whether interest rates go up, whatever happens, they will, the valuations will come down because the issue is that the exit, the, ge the general exit is 10, 15, 20 million, that's all. So if people raise it to 6 million or 5 million or something like that, have some more capital, then there almost certainly be a down round at the point of exit. I don't really want that to happen. I want to go in at the right amount. Now, we'll support founders not being over diluted later with option pools, but I don't want to go in too much at the beginning. So I do not adhere to the VC viewpoint, which is binary. You back a lot, you don't care about the valuation at the beginning, you will sort it out later on. You'll sort it out with preferences, you'll sort it out with moving founders or whatever. If it's going to work, it's going to work really well. So no, two million max really. This, this bedbug one that's just gone into, they've already got the product, they've already got two customers, we went in at 1.4, so it's that sort of number. This means that London is basically out of bounds for me in my philosophy. Let's go back to the guy here. Uh, Actually, a really relevant follow-on from that question. What's your approach to early stage valuation? Yeah, what's my approach to early stage valuation? Well, in the end, it's negotiation, isn't it? You, you will, as an entrepreneur, come up with some, hopefully, some guidelines based on other similar companies. You will obviously try to 
get it as high as possible. That's what's natural, isn't it? When you're negotiating everything, we will reset down to the point where we're comfortable or we'll walk away. And of course, the walking away is very much easier than the negotiations on. So if you ask too much to start with, and this varies, you will get angels here in London who are completely valuation independent. But, and I'm really talking about Cambridge and the environment there, which is by, by cap per capita, is very much more active than London. You know, Cambridge Angel 60 has invested 28 million last year as a group. You know, there are no angel groups, that, and I, I know this because I'm president of the trade body, there's no angel groups in the whole of Europe doing less than that. We like the small VC, but we're really choosy. So I can't map our experience up there down to here. Having said that, over half my investments are in London, but I haven't done many new ones in the last two or three years because valuations, in my view, are too high. Well, for the reasons, this is why it's one more than one founder. I did mention that earlier on, single point of failure. I remember the single founder I had, he was only about a year and a half into it, and he fell badly off his tricycle. The, the um, front axle broke, and you you know, he only broke something. I think he broke his finger or something. I mean, you know, who knows? But that isn't the main point, because the chance of any of you being injured or killed is very, very low, which is why your life insurance is relatively low. It's because of the dynamics of two or more founders working together to solve problems. And it's much better for the entrepreneurs if they are together and they'll be more independent and they will solve the problems by consensus rather than a single person. That's why. Gentlemen here. So this is where the development cycle is quite long. How do I define traction? Yeah. No, it won't be, be traction will be based on the progress of the technology as you move forward. So there will have to be some KPIs which then trigger the next round, uh, which you will need to somehow achieve. If you don't achieve them, they have to think about the timing of that round, the value of that round, and the amount of money you need. So no, that's absolutely normal. It doesn't need, if you mean traction, you mean customer traction. It absolutely doesn't, in my view, need that. Again, back to the app, that definitely needs that, but not the sort of thing I do. How are we doing? How are we doing? Five minutes. Five minutes? Um, this chap's new. I don't know how to say. What's your opinion of um, incubators like YC? Does that give more credibility to. Yeah, so incubators. Well, YC, um, actually, <laughs> my first journey, which was the Go Test It, uh, we exited a software company in Cambridge, but I didn't even know what Angel was before I went into that. He then, <laughs> it was 40% down, 60% later, and he broke the deal and left to join YC, so he didn't get his 60% and neither did I. And then he went on to build a business called Reported, which some of you might just know, I think it's just about dead now, which was bought by LinkedIn for 14 million, um, which I didn't invest in. <laughs> you know, I, I don't have it on here, but I have a slide of all the ones that got away, like Swift team, for instance. Um, so, uh, YC is uh, almost the wrong example, isn't it? Because that's probably regarded as the most important, most successful well, accelerator it is in the, in, 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 in the world, in the same way that EF is trying to be here in London. So EF has got a different model, of course. EF based, based at, anybody on EF? No, Entrepreneur First, Matt and Alice set it up about six, seven years ago. They do it on the basis of career choice, or they did, we've changed the model now, career choice for bright people coming out of university who don't want to be entrepreneurial but don't know what they want to do. So they bring in people and then they form teams and reform teams and they gradually exit, there's probably another way, but they exit quite a lot of people on the accelerator program. They change that to, they realize that graduates, entrepreneurs actually aren't very good because they're not really old enough, mature enough to build businesses so they've gone right to stage. Uh, I think if you get the opportunity to go on some sort of, it creates slightly different. Accelerator in my view is they buy some equity cheap and they accelerate the valuation to bring more equity in. Incubate is just an environment where you're going to learn, like this, you know, most of this floor and the other floor must be an incubation space, effectively. There may be accelerators run here. Jan, whatever his name, you run that uh, EdTech one from here. So I, I think it's good if you can get on them, generally. You will get over-mentored on some of these programs. You know, you'll get completely confused by all the various things you're told. They are, to some extent, a competitor for angels because Angels hang around them and get close to the deals first. Um, but I think, in general, th th there's an oversupply of accelerators. It's certainly in the UK, probably in the Valley, probably in New York, maybe not in Boston. So, you know, there will be some consolidation eventually. 
But I think as entrepreneurs, if you can get on one, it will be beneficial. Back out there. What dictates what? You're talking about me specifically? Well, yeah, like if you own the activity that you're taking, so therefore I won't be really involved with it? Yes, yeah, so what dictates whether I'm active or passive? Yeah, I'm only active, super active on the board if I really get involved with it. And as I say, I'm on nine boards of various sorts and on 58 companies I've invested in. I'm not, well, some of them have been on the board, actually. But say 50 of them haven't been on the board. Yeah, so I'll only get really close if I really can add value and really interest. And if, in fact, I've only just deal led for the first time in three years because it's really hard work. I've got a few other things on my plate. And I did that because we've employed somebody who became dangerous to help with the process because there's quite a lot of administration there. If I've deal led, I'd expect to be onto the board. So we have this woman here. Finally, we get a female last question. Thank you. Um, what, are your, what have been your biggest surprises or shocks? What do you mean, my? Any examples of stories? Biggest surprises or shocks? Oh, difficult one there. Um, no, I think all entrepreneurs have got the ability to shock me in some way or other the whole time. So you, um, you, you are still being surprised. Oh, yes, because learning. we're dealing with people. Yeah. People are not necessarily rational. You know, at some point, I presume there'll be software companies set up by software that's actually run by software that exits by software. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, masses of things, you know. One of the journeys I went on, which is one of the reasons I don't do husband and wife, was boyfriend, girlfriend, a fiance, fiance, husband, wife, husband, wife, child, he gets a job. <laughs> you know, that was that was pretty you know, it wasn't actually going anywhere and it was probably the right thing to do, but suddenly to announce to the shareholders he was closing it down or selling it on for that. Oh, what else? I mean no, I really can't think of anything um, I mean during Due diligence, it was an example of due diligence. We got to the point where we invest, a big group was going to invest in something, and this is this is, should be a, a lesson really. And on the final call, probably before the legals, the term sheet being agreed, but the final call before the legals, one of the investors, one of our investors, had dug around in the prelims offering and found a similar package in the States. And on the call, the entrepreneur said, Yes, I know about that, but I didn't think it mattered. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine one? So you could hear people dropping off the conference call <laughs> one by one. So yeah, human nature, we've all in this room, I hope, been in some sort of relationship. I'm sure you've been shocked by <laughs> in those relationships. You know, anything under the sun. But I, uh, sorry, I, I haven't prepared for that question because I can't give you a, 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 a funny answer really. But another woman about that. Yeah, really, really good question that, yeah. The investment, the guy I've just been seeing now is here, I invested, in fact, it wasn't on those rules at all. Now, it was when the rules were being developed, but it's it's a publishing organisation, you know, why did I get into that? You know, as it turns out, I enjoy his company. If I get a one and a half X, I'd be, you know, after 10 years, but I actually enjoy spending time with him. Um, the, I have a B to, well, two, two other examples. One, I have a B to C called Cambridge New Suit, which is Cam Neutral. Um, which is a, uh, it's basically called a tomato pill, it's a capital from Nestle, it's like a peen if anybody's medical here, or, um, and it's basically like eating a, a, a kilo of tomatoes in a pill, which has got, you know, gives you the Mediterranean diet and therefore might protect against um, various forms of a stroke and, and heart attack. And it's because I knew the founders, I knew the chair, etc. But an even better example is a company called Exonate, where which is a drug discovery for wet macular degeneration, if anybody knows what that is. And this is basically an injection in the eye. So the two things need to happen. One, the molecules got to get through the eyeball, which is really difficult, and he's got to work on the retina when he gets there. I haven't a clue how that works, but I know the CEO, I didn't know the CSO, the Chief Scientific Officer, I knew the chair, and I knew one of the other. So it's backing people, again. So that's why I take it. <laughs> Alan, did you hear that one? <laughs> Am I breaking my own rule about emotional relationships and working my son? Two answers to that. One, I will, though I haven't done yet, I would look closely at investing in a 
relationship where emotional involvement, now it's a different sort of love with one's children or one's parents than it is with one's partner, it's a different altogether. The bond's much stronger, you know, there's a blood bond there. So I, would, I haven't done that, but I would consider that, particularly um, brother, 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 sister probably, rather than father, son, which would seem slightly strange. And have I broken, what rule have I broken? What rule have I broken? I haven't invested, well I have invested, I've written some few, few checks to get to this point. <laughs> And I'll just explain, I mean, I'm sure Red Arms said this before, so he won't mind, um, is that he came back to Cambridge and after doing lots of really exciting things, I'm really envious about travelling around the world, etc. Lots and lots of exciting things. And uh, was, going, was doing a master's and wanted to find some work, and I've been employed in a building company for the time and so on. And so we set up Invest Investor. And it's very clear that he was working for me till about a year ago, and I'm definitely working for him. So that relationship is great. If you can get to that with one of your children, if you have any children, that it, it makes you really a will that does make me very proud to be able to do that. But remember, this isn't an investment, except an investment in people's knowledge, experience, connections, uh, and working together, which is good fun. Um, it's a startup of my own. That doesn't apply. My rules for investment do not apply to my own startup. Uh, another one? Oh, no, no, take this gently, gentlemen, there, please. relationship with VCs, yeah, I don't know how long I've got, but just quickly a bit of time. Really, I mean, I have fired a VC in his own office. He was going to invest in a business. I knew he didn't have a very good reputation. I got him to say something. I just asked, what do you do if the founder isn't performing? And he explained the situation of the company. I won't tell you where it was, where they fired, the VC fired both the founder and the chair, you know, because they're protecting their investment, they're protecting their LPs, the people who've got the money for investment. In Cambridge, we have a very close relationship with the three VCs, and they know they need to behave themselves where they can be possible, because of course, the deals they get have been incubated by the angels, and the angels sit on the board and help the entrepreneurs on the journey. That does not necessarily apply everywhere else. There is again an example I like to give, which is actually in Cambridge, but the VCs weren't in Cambridge, of a business that sold for $100 million, and the founder got nothing, nothing, and this is because of liquidation preferences, which may or may not mean anything to you. The liquidation preferences added up to squash the ordinaries completely. You know, so there's no doubt having VC money on board is something that as an angel that goes in with ordinary shares right at the beginning fears at times. And so a, a less capital intensive business in principle is one we'd rather back. Uh, no, the lady first, you already asked before. So this is the value I'm trying to create, being president of the trade body of the, the European uh, Business Angel Network. Yeah, yeah. so, so we're basically, what's, why am I doing it and what does EVAN do? So the European Business Angel Network, 20th birthday coming up in a couple of months, was set up actually to support uh, entrepreneurs originally, and now more to, because there weren't many angels around 20 years ago, and now it supports angels more and angel networks. What we're trying to do is both lobbying at Brussels level, it's based in Brussels, uh, with n incentives for helping investors invest in startups, uh, not just in Brussels but throughout the whole of Europe, with connecting. So there's a, you know, I have this 90 minute rule. Is this the question you're asking? You're looking at this? No, no, no. Okay, fine. So I had, I, I, was, I had three hats on recently. I was at talking to an event in, um, in Boston. And so I was asked to express what I thought about cross border investing. And I, I guess you're French, are you? Or? No. Okay. <laughs> Cross-border investing, and I said, no, I've got a 90-minute rule. How can I get a cross-border from Cambridge? So, but of course, I can't say that as president of the European Business Central Network because we are promoting cross-border investing. Because if any of you came from, come from Croatia or you know any of the smaller countries in uh, the old Eastern Europe, then you will find that there are lots of great entrepreneurs and very little capital. So the capital has to come from somewhere else. So we're, we're supporting and with networking, with platforms to try and get more capital flow around the Eurozone and training associated with that. So the trade body's there for upwards to government and downwards for training, networking and improving the ecosystem. What's your own mission there, your personal mission? 
my personal mission, mm, I can't, can't tell you. No, I can't really tell you, but because it's not in the public domain. But I have got, as, as, you know, as anybody who joins any organisation as chair, and I've done that to charity many times, you set yourself some targets for how you want to hand over the organisation at the end of your term to the next chair in a better state than it was before. And, I, and if anybody knows Candice Johnson, no? She was the previous chair, American lady, entrepreneurial, great lady, great lady, but she has a different way of looking at things and I'm taking my way, which is results-based, away from her way. So I'm hoping that the organization will be better. 